Good morning, church. Welcome to Faith Lutheran. We are glad that you're here. Uh, you are all a bunch of good swimmers, right? You got here. You came by boat or uh, by uh, paddle board or kayak. Uh, we are blessed and very thankful that the uh, brunt of the storm has um, stayed away from us. But we do pray for all those who are in the storm's path, of course. And uh, for those of you who are gathered physically present, um, we will worship the Lord with, in spirit and truth. And those of you who are online, who are staying home and are safe and warm, and uh, we are happy that you're joining us um, online, and uh, please participate fully in all of uh, our liturgy and prayers. Uh, you might also want to set uh, a table with bread and wine, especially today. A uh, couple of announcements before we get started. Uh, today, the Iverson family was intending to be here. Uh, we were going to, and we still will, have a commendation prayer right before the uh, benediction. The Iverson family has decided uh, to have funeral services for Marty uh, up in Minnesota, uh, so uh, we will have this one prayer here today. They were going to also be gathering during coffee hour, but because of the inclement weather, they de decided it was better for them to stay home and safe. So we are connected with them as they watch and are uh, with us here uh, through the, the blessing of the internet, but um, we uh, will remember and celebrate Marty's life and commend her to God together later. Uh, also, I invite you and encourage you to please uh, pray for the people of Venezuela. Uh, many of you know uh, President Maduro of Venezuela is uh, not acknowledging the results of the election where more than 70% of the people voted uh, for opposition. And right now he is uh, executing any opposition leaders and people in the street. There's more than 540 thousand Venezuelans that are undocumented here in this country. That's the estimate. Many of them here in Florida. Uh, wonderful people that had uh, run from a regime that was brutal, and it seems that more will be running. So as that region is uh, destabilized, it will, uh, of course, impact us. But as, uh, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we are reminded uh, that even though Venezuela may seem far away, that these are children of God and they are being victimized and terrorized. And uh, therefore their problems are our problems and we shouldn't relax in our own comfortability. Uh, we should be very uncomfortable about that and, and we should commend that to prayer and action. So please uh, don't, uh, don't choose not to, to think about their, their situation. Uh, there are, uh, of course, uh, other things uh, that have happened, are happening uh, in the life of the church. Yesterday, uh, we had a wonderful uh, gathering um, up in Lakewood Ranch for the ordination to word and sacrament of Roger Raditz. Uh, Pastor Raditz, uh, as many of you know, was here in residence last summer. Uh, he oversaw some of the uh, young people, uh, their programming as they went to do hurricane relief work following Hurricane Ian. And uh, we became good friends with him. He even came and preached here during our, our Lenten uh, lunches. Uh, we are very thankful to God that God has raised up another servant uh, in the church in Roger and that Roger has accepted a call to Alaska uh, to serve. So uh, we, um, we will continue to pray for him and uh, I know he will be a blessing. Uh, so let's celebrate uh, with Roger. Um, last night, uh, I got news that a, a, another one of my good friends uh, died. Uh, his name is Court Cousins, volunteer firefighter, uh, paramedic, EMT. Uh, he, uh, during 9-11, responded uh, down to Ground Zero and 13 years ago came down with the 9-11 uh, related cancer, fought valiantly, uh, but leaves behind uh, his young family. 
Uh, so I invite you to please pray with me for the cousin family as uh, we remember his service to his uh, community and uh, his sacrifice. So I know uh, September 11th happened a long time ago, uh, but uh, please know that there are still victims, uh, the people that are dying because of that day. Uh, and we should, of course, um, remember first and foremost that violence is never the answer to solve anything. And uh, there's always a continued kind of um, consequence that, uh, that comes out of any type of violent action as we, as we see for generations now. So thank you for that indulgence. Thank you for praying for the cousins. We are also praying for Judy Carlson, who is suffering from pneumonia. And we're praying for Kathy Shilio, who thankfully is doing better and is in rehab, okay? Um, I think that's pretty much enough for now, right? I think it's enough. Uh, so again, welcome. We are glad that you're here to worship the Lord in spirit and truth. Hello to the quartet. Thank you for being here. And thank you, David, of course. And at this time, I'm going to invite uh, Pastor Mary. Ann oh, and I should say, Pastor Larry's back from vacation. So uh, welcome back, <laughs> Pastor Larry. Uh, but Pastor Mary Ann, if you could lead us in the word, that would be a blessing. Please stand as you are able. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. Amen. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. Holy God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, eternal goodness, immeasurable love, you place your gifts before us. We eat and are satisfied. Fill us and this world in all its need with the life that comes only from you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for the readings. A reading from Exodus. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you. And each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way I will test them whether they will follow my, follow my instruction or not. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, 
and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew surrounded the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be to God. A reading from Ephesians. I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling of which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean that they also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. 
we must no longer be children, tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way unto him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. So at this time, we have a children's moment. So, Bebo, can you want to come on down? Huh? No, you're Febo, right? Yeah. You, you want to come down with him? You can come down with him. That's great. Because he probably won't come down on his own, I think. Would you? Come on, sit down. Let's, uh, I want to talk about something that's pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. The whole family. First of all, welcome. I have a joke, right? Uh, this, is, uh, this is good. What do you call uh, a tiny mom? A mini mom. It's an English joke, right? Anyway, because I know you're from England. Anyway, never try to do jokes on the fly. So today I want to talk a little bit about Mr. Kevin just read some words from Pastor Paul a long time ago. And uh, I have a question for you. The question is, um, who do you think the most important person is here in the church? Nice answer. Give me five. <laughs> Now talk about that. Tell me, tell me what are you going to tell me next? So if nobody's, everyone is equal. Well, you are uh, a theologian in your own right. You're absolutely right. So Paul says that God has given some special gifts to people. Some people are evangelists. That means they are people who like to talk about and share the good news about Jesus. Some people are prophets. Well, prophets kind of hard, but oftentimes prophets tell the truth to powerful people, even if it's dangerous for them. Sometimes they have to tell people to stop and things like that. Some are teachers. Do you know any teachers in your life? Yeah, so you know teachers. But teachers sometimes are teachers that are professional teachers in school. But who else teaches you a bunch of stuff? Your mom does, right? How about the guy right next to you that you're leaning on? Your dad does, right? <laughs> well, maybe you're a prophet. <laughs> Telling the truth. So, you know, you understand already, but it's important for everybody to remember that uh, it takes all of us working together to do Jesus' work. Because as you said, and you were right, we are all equal, but does the world treat everybody the same? It doesn't, right? Some people are suffering and other people aren't, right? Is that fair? No. So how do you think that gets fixed? How can, if there's unfairness and some people are being treated good and other people aren't being treated well, how does that get fixed? Who can, who can fix it? Who can, who can try? You can't fix it. Maybe you're right. We can never fix it completely, but should we try a little bit, maybe, you think? Yeah, and maybe that's all we're, we're called to do, to try. Right, but it would mean we would have to try to help other people, right? So your sister's up here, and that's cool, but we have to be careful together that she doesn't fall, right? So if she was, goes over there, your dad can scoop her up. If she came over here, I would try to scoop her up. But that's how the world works. We are here to try to help each other, and Paul says, we want to build each other up, not take each other down, right? So Jesus' message 
is that we are all very important, everybody, not just people that are prophets or evangelists or pastors. Each and every one of us has a very, very special part to play, something to do, and we have gifts from God to use. You might be super smart, and maybe that's what you use to help build up the world. You might be really strong, and maybe you use your strength to help others that are weaker. You understand, right? Okay. And I know she understands. But, but the, the, the goal is that everybody can be as carefree as your sister, so that they can run around and explore knowing that it's gonna be okay. Hey, can you come over here? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Right. So let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you that you give us to each other as gifts and that you've entrusted each and every one of us with uh, some special talents. We ask that we would use all that we have been entrusted with uh, to glorify you and to help one another. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Fantastic. Can you give me five? All right. Can you give me five? All right. Beville, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> This is the Holy Gospel according to St. John. Glory to you, O Lord. When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were beside the sea, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to perform the works of God. And Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, What sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. So there was uh, an older man from the old country and he was uh, in an old established restaurant downtown. He walks in there, and he orders a bowl of soup. They give him a couple slices of bread. He eats the soup, eats the bread. The maitre d' comes over and says, how was it? And uh, the old man looks up and says, was good, but could give more bread. So the week goes by, next Monday, like clockwork, here comes the old man again. He comes, he sits down. This time the maitre d' remembers, tells the waiter, listen, give him four slices of bread. So the man eats his soup, eats his bread, and the maitre d' comes over and says, how was it? 
was was good, but could be more bread. So the maitre d' is not given up. Next Monday rolls around, the old man walks in, he orders the soup, maitre d' tells the waiter, gives him eight slices of bread. So there he is, he's eating the soup, he eats the bread, maitre d' comes over, how was it? He goes, was good, but could be more bread. So the following week, the maitre d' goes across to the bakery, has a huge six foot loaf of bread uh, baked specially for him. Sure enough, the guy comes in, the maitre d' brings the loaf into the kitchen, they cut it in half, cut it down the middle, both sides, put butter on it, they give him his bowl of soup, and they bring the bread. The man eats his soup, eats all the bread, and uh, the maitre d' says, how was it? And he goes, was good. But uh, back to only two pieces of bread? <laughs> the point is, folks, we are never satisfied, are we? We have this perpetual, insatiable hunger. And we have been programmed to be that way. I mean, everybody in marketing, anybody who is uh, selling anything, really wants you as a consumer not to be satisfied for too long. We don't have things that are uh, crafted and mass produced that last a long time anymore because that's not good for business. We want it to, to break down. We tend to lean into this idea that everything should be disposable. So you have to buy more and more and more. And happiness is supposed to be associated with that kind of consumption. And this is very difficult for us as people of faith to be bombarded with this messaging all the time and yet to also cling to this countercultural truth that Jesus offers, which is that Jesus is enough. Is enough to satisfy our hungry heart. The people of God in the first lesson that Kevin read for us, we kind of just drop in here to a bunch of Israelites complaining. But let's go back in the story. Let's remember what happened to them, right? You remember that Joseph had the dream interpretation gift from God after all sorts of crazy circumstances, he ended up being in Pharaoh's court and he helped save the people of Egypt and many others, including his own family, from famine by preparing and feeding so that Joseph and his family could live in Goshen, this great area in Egypt. But then there came a time where there was a Pharaoh that didn't know Joseph. We read, and as a result, they're enslaved, right? And you know the whole thing, they're making bricks with not enough straw, not enough dirt, not enough water in the hot sun. And they're crying out to God day and night, help, help. God hears their cries and raises up Moses, not the perfect leader and a reluctant leader. And between Moses and his brother Aaron, they... They lead, and they confront the power, very prophetic. Go to Pharaoh, let my people go. You know, the plagues come, all this drama. But then they're instructed to have a Passover feast. And with girded line, loins, they, there they are eating and sharing roasted goat and sheep. And then they make a break for it. And they're running from Egypt after they've been given permission to go. That doesn't last long. Pharaoh sends his army hot on their tail. They get to the sea. What are they going to do? God tells Moses to lift the staff. He does. You know, the waters part. The Israelites make it through on dry ground. The waters come back, and Pharaoh and his horsemen are trapped in the sea, and they're gone. And there's even a song about it. All that 
that stuff happens. Now they get into the desert. They're thirsty. They cry out. God provides water for them in the desert. By this time, you would think that they understood that God has their back. God's not going to let them die there. And yet, in the text we have before us today, they cry out to Moses. We would have been better off if we would have stayed back there eating the flesh pots in Egypt, eating the scraps from the Egyptians, having their fill with the leftover bread. It's better than starving out here. So God hears, but what does God do? Does God punish them? No. God provides again. God gives them quails at night and gives them manna during the day. Now, many scientists are like, uh, you know, try to wrap their head around the miracle of manna. What is manna? Some say it's crystallized insects. Delicious. <laughs> Others say maybe lichens, like a moss. Others said it was sap from a tree that had hardened. We don't know. But what we know is it sustained them. And they weren't to gather more than one day. So every day they trusted on God's providing, except when it was a Sabbath day, then they could hold on to it for an extra day without it molding. Another miracle. I don't think we have to dig too far to embrace the truth that God provides for God's people. Always provides for God's people. God, a matter of fact, has no other choice but then to provide for us. Because we are God's beloved. It's really hard, you know, to maybe for us to understand the mysteries of faith. And yet, we are constantly called to embrace them. In the Lutheran Church, we have sacraments. Yesterday, uh, Roger was ordained to the Ministry of Word and Sacrament. And again, this is not a status thing above and beyond any other member of the body of Christ, but there's a particular function within that calling and that setting apart that happened yesterday. So people like Mary Ann, myself, and uh, Larry, and Roger, we are called to preside over these sacraments. And the Lutheran Church, we basically look at two. And it's perfect with the rain coming down because one of them is baptism, right? Baptism and the ancient prayers allude to the great flood and the chaos that's out there, but that these waters are ones that claim us and protect us and keep us safe. In holy baptism, we believe that there is efficacy there is power. It's not just a symbol. It's not just a ritual. What it is, is a means of grace. That means in those waters, we are claimed by God and marked with the cross of Christ, and we are given a promise which is unbreakable and unshakable. We remember that every time we gather when we celebrate someone's life when we have a funeral, like today when we remember Marty, or last week when we remembered Al. And Al, he was someone who understood his baptismal promise in such a strong way, the claiming that God does upon us. And with that is that promise for provision. But where do we receive our manna? Where do we receive our bread from heaven? Well, the other sacrament that's here, the other means of grace, the other thing with power which has been entrusted to Christ's church is the Eucharist, Holy Communion. The word Eucharist means thanksgiving. It's us giving thanks to God for God's provision for us in Jesus. 
And we remember, of course, that in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, he blessed it, broke it, gave it to his disciples. He said, take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it for all to drink. Saying, this is the new promise, the new covenant that my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. It's not just a reenactment or a remembrance that we do. Some other Christian denominations believe that. We believe in the true presence of Jesus Christ in this supper. A little bit differently than our Roman Catholic cousins. And I'll give you a little theological kind of uh, understanding or perspective. So Martin Luther and uh, some of his contemporary Roman Catholic theologians got into it, as well as some of the Swiss reformers, such as Wingley, about the presence and true presence. So the Roman Catholic stance is that it's transubstantiation. The bread and the wine is transformed, like almost on a molecular level. And now it's no longer wine, it's molecules of blood. It's no longer uh, bread, it's Corpus Christi. But the Lutherans, Martin Luther said, no, it is the true presence, but not at that level. Instead of this transubstantiation, it's consubstantiation. Anybody in the deacon class, you know this, cold, right, Deborah? It means with the bread and wine, with the words that we hear from God's holy word, the Bible, through the sermon that's being preached, and also through the remembrance and those words of institution, and through those elements of bread and wine, gifts that God has provided for all of us, while the assembly is gathered, in those prayers, Jesus becomes present for us. So Jesus is above, below, before, behind, within, and all around that bread, and all around that wine. And when we consume that together in community, it has that efficacy, it has that power. It fills us and satisfies us in a way that no earthly meal can do. That no earthly meal can do. It empowers us to become kind of living saboriums. Saborium is a fancy uh, term for the container that we put the bread in on the altar. We become a container of Christ. And we walk through the world, whether we're working at the, the, the um, dentist's office, or in a, uh, we're a lawyer, or we're a, a first responder, or a teacher, or uh, we're a, you know, a homemaker. It doesn't matter what our vocational calling is. Wherever we go, we are bringing Christ with us. It's that kind of understanding that transforms not only our thinking, but our being in the world and releases us from this constant need to have to satisfy some other earthly hunger. You see, it sounds counterintuitive, but we actually are fed more than we feed others. As we are giving, we are receiving. There's a story about uh, back in the days when uh, traveling salesmen used to go around and peddle their wares and do their things. There was a group of them, and they were in Chicago, in O'Hare Airport, uh, and uh, they were trying to get home, and they all uh, gathered around the payphone and called their spouses and said, uh, we're, we're coming home, we'll be home for dinner. They each barred and did that. So they're waiting for the flight to take off. Well, they heard an announcement overhead, and it said that the, there was a gate change, so they all grabbed their stuff to scurry over so they could make that flight. Well, one of the salesmen, in his haste, 
grabbed his stuff and turned around and hit this uh, stand of apples that this young girl was trying to sell. And the apples are rolling all over the floor. Well, all the rest of the salesmen ran, but the one who hit them told the other salesman, please call my wife, tell her I'm going to have to catch a later flight. I, I have to help. So he gets there on his hands and knees, and there's this 11-year-old girl, and she's crying, and it's clear she's feeling for the apples, and it's clear to the salesman that she's blind. So he really feels like he did the right thing. So he's gathering the apples, and he notices many of them are bruised, and they won't be able to be sold. So he takes them, puts them aside, and gives her $40, a lot of money back then. And he says, I'm really sorry for all of this, uh, you know, here. And then he goes to leave, and she calls over to him, and she says, uh, sir, sir, wait. And he says, yeah. He goes, I just want to know, are you Jesus? And the man says, no, I'm not Jesus. I'm, I'm a sinner. I'm, I'm, I'm far from perfect. If uh, Jesus wouldn't even bumped into your apples. <laughs> and she says, the reason why I ask is because when I heard my apple starting to fall to the ground, I just prayed that Jesus would help me to get them gathered up again and would make everything okay. And she said, and Jesus sent you. Brothers and sisters, there are people all over with apples on the floor. There are people that have tried and are doing their best, uh, are living in a world extremely vulnerable and we're racing past them because we have somewhere to go, something to do, some other agenda. And yet, God is calling us to get on our knees and pick up the map and, and to help as we can, where we can. Because we don't have to do any of the other stuff, really. What is the greatest calling that we have but to stoop down and help a child in need? Any beloved child of God. Is that not what God has done and continues to do for us over and over and over again in Christ Jesus? We made a mess of this place. We made a mess of everything. And God comes down onto God's knees in Jesus Christ picks us up, all battered and bruised, restores us, loves us, feeds us, and sends us. It's such a, an enormous privilege. As I had mentioned, uh, Court Cousins, a friend of mine, who uh, is a paramedic, volunteer fireman, who died uh, yesterday, uh, or I found out yesterday. But it reminded me also of, of something else that uh, Fred Rogers from, you know, Mr. Rogers thought uh, about. Fred Rogers was a Presbyterian pastor, many of you know, and he chose to live out his pastoral calling by starting this children's ministry, Mr. Rogers Neighborhood, which I uh, watched daily as a child. I'm a better person for it. You love your neighbor, that was the whole point. But he said that when he was a kid, when he was little, and he used to sit with his mom and watch television and would see a, a riot or would see a disaster, would see something bad, happening and was afraid. And when he would ask his mom, Mom, where is God there? His mom would tell him, look for the helpless, Fred. Look for the helpless. God is there in the helpless. Brothers and sisters, you are 
controlled by God, secured in your faith by God's power, which God claims you. You have nothing to fear, not even death itself. God will make sure that you're okay. As he cared for those he liberated a long time ago in Egypt and wouldn't stop caring and providing for them, God will not stop caring and providing for you. But, as we heard from the children in the children's sermon, right? The world is an unfair place. So therefore, there needs to be helpers, people full of Christ in this world to continue to do that very important work of Jesus. And it's you and me, Jerry. Perfect amen. Perfect amen. So the question is, not are we up to the task, right? But... Um, the question is, where do we get started? And this can overwhelm some people. But again, don't overthink it. Just be it. God has given you eyes, these gifts you open every day. God has, has given you areas in which to work, people, community that you have to meet. There are opportunities here within our community, and as we interface with the larger community. But the opportunities are endless, but so is God's provision. It's endless. So don't be afraid of getting in over your head. Because if you do, you know, God will provide that way for you to rise above. So let us not, for even a moment, Doubt God's provision. And let us not for a moment lose sight of the awesome and privileged position that we find ourselves in as helpers in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Together we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated for the prayers. Calling on the spirit of wisdom to guide our hearts and minds, let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. O oh, wise one, your wisdom has been present in this world since its beginning. Pour out your wisdom into the hearts of the whole church, especially the newly baptized, lay leaders, deacons, pastors, and bishops. Merciful God, receive, receive our, our prayer. prayer. Holy God of all creation, you are the source of all life. Where the sun blazes hard and strong, bring a gentle breeze. In the places experiencing the cold of winter, bring your warmth. Merciful God, receive, receive our, our prayer. prayer. Compassionate God, help government leaders of this world unite for peace and justice. Humble all who hold authority. The power is directed toward a more just society. We pray especially for peace in Gaza, Ukraine, Haiti, Myanmar, Venezuela, and the more than 15 war-torn areas in Africa. Merciful God, receive, receive our, our prayer. prayer. Bread of life from heaven, you feed us. Fill all who hungry with needed nutrition and open our hearts to eliminate hunger in this world. We pray especially for those on our prayer list and those we name before you now, aloud or in our hearts. Judy Carlson. Kathy Shilio. May we see a day when all are fed. Merciful God, receive, receive our, our prayer. prayer. O oh, wisdom of truth, help us to understand your will for the church. Be with congregations experiencing transition, redevelopment, and the exciting yet frightening path of newness. May your wisdom be found at every step. Merciful God, receive, receive our, our prayer. prayer. Redeeming God. We give you thanks for the lives and witness of your saints now departed, especially Katie Bolin, Al Hirsch, Marty Iverson, and Janice Lorenz. Bring your beloved into eternal glory, opening wide the gates to the heavenly banquet. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Faithful God, we ask your presence for those who are in the path of the storm for those who fear the wind and the rain, those who are buffeted by the other storms of life. Make your presence known to them and strengthen them in their faith. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We lift up these prayers to you, gracious God. Receive them into your holy keeping. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And, and also, also with you. you. Feel free to greet your friend, neighbors in peace.
Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, you have set this table with your very self and called us to the feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us in this meal. Make us to be what we receive here, your body for the life of the world. Amen. 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 The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks. 
thanks to who the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you. Almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. <laughs> Almighty and merciful God, you are most holy, and great is the majesty of your glory. You so love the world that you gave your only Son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. We give you thanks for his coming into the world to fulfill for us your holy will and to accomplish all things for our salvation. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his salutary command, his life-giving passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and the promise of his coming again, we give thanks to you, O Lord God Almighty, not as we ought, but as we are able. And we ask you mercifully to accept our praise and thanksgiving, and with your word and Holy Spirit to bless us, your servants, and these, your own gifts of bread and wine so that we and all who share in the body and blood of Christ may be filled with heavenly blessing and grace and receiving the forgiveness of sin may be formed to live as your holy people and be given our inheritance with all your saints. To you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory in your holy church now and forever. So gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Christ has set the table with more than enough for all. Come, all are welcome.
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Amen. I invite you to please be seated for a moment as we remember Marty Iverson. Uh, we sent out a special um, update, but I'd like to read from her obituary to you and then we'll do a commendation prayer. And I know that uh, the weather is inclement and a lot more family wanted to gather, but uh, Jason, you're here. So we're very thankful for your presence here uh, today. Uh, our prayers will continue for your entire family. So the world is a little sadder as Marty Martha Jean Iverson, uh, Nee Anderson, passed away unexpectedly on Monday, July 22nd at her home in Sarasota, Florida. Marty was born in Austin, Minnesota on August 26, 1946, and raised on the family farm in Austin with her younger brother, Robert. Marty graduated from Austin High in 64, met Ron, uh, while they both attended the University of Wisconsin, Stout. They met January 20th, 1968, had two children, Jody and Jason. Marty and Ron lived in a variety of locations in southeastern Wisconsin uh, during their working lives, including Milwaukee, Richfield, Jackson, Plymouth, where they were active members of Redeemer Lutheran Church. After Marty retired from her instructor position at the Kettle Moraine Correctional Institute, she and Ron achieved their dream of living on a lake uh, with their move to a small Wisconsin, a uh, small lake, uh, Wissota, in Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin, with Marty's outgoing and dynamic personality, and may I add, riveting smile. Uh, they became quick, active members of the community and English Lutheran Church of Bateman. Marty also served as a volunteer at the Mayo Hospital uh, in Eau Claire, sang in the choir, quilted and sewed, traveled with her friends, hosted innumerable dinners and gatherings at their lake home, and together with Ron, offered boat rides to many. Marty was the life of the party. Many friendships Marty established continue through today. Just a couple of weeks before her death, Marty had a wonderful time visiting several of these friends back in Wisconsin while also celebrating a dear friend's 80th birthday. Marty and her husband Ron had been wintering in Florida in their retirement years until moving to Sarasota full time in the early summer of 2023 to be closer to their children. Both Judy and uh, Jody and Jason currently reside in Sarasota. Marty will be remembered by her husband Ron, her children Jody, uh, and Kirk and Jason, and the many cousins, nieces, nephews she had, and the multitude of friends and people whose lives this wonderful woman touched and gladdened. Marty was preceded in death by her father, uh, Leonard, um, and mother, Marianne, brother, Bob, and great nephews, Brandon, sister-in-law, Donna, and brother-in-law, Richard. Sadness is upon us as we have lost a bright light, a dear wife, mother, and sweet friend. However, with absolute certainty, we know she is with her Lord and free from all pain and worry. And for that, we give thanks as well as for the absolute and joyous gift of being her spouse, child, relative, or friend. This is a life that was well lived beyond measure. 
And I would just like to add uh, that Marty um, really flavored our congregation in a beautiful way. Uh, her smile was infectious. Uh, she was very active in our um, food pantry ministry uh, and uh, would always try to be as helpful as possible. Uh, it was, and it still is, a shock to many of us, uh, but we know that we will meet again one day at the Lord's table at the feast which has no end. So at this time, we are going to commend our sister Marty, Martha, into God's hands. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant, our sister, Marty. Acknowledge we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive her into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of all the saints in life. Amen. Please stand for the benediction. Now receive a blessing. The blessing of God who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us be upon you now and forever. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. You are the body of Christ. Thanks be to God. I will sing of God's word.